Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for being here for our webinar this morning, uh, focused on the why and how of ocean and coastal acidification citizen science monitoring. My name is Aaron Strong. I'm an assistant professor of marine policy at the University of Maine, and we just want to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar. This is the first webinar in a two-part webinar series. The next one will be at 10 a.m. on April 18th, where we will discuss issues of calibration and collaboration. These webinars have been put together uh, by an amazing and wonderful team that I want to acknowledge. Uh, Beth Turner at NOAA, Esperanza Stanshoff at University of Maine Sea Grant and Cooperative Extension, Parker Gassett at the University of Maine, Rue Morrison at NIRACUS, the Northeast Regional Association for Coastal Ocean Observing Systems, and Kelly Canisi at NIRACUS as well. Um, these webinars are part of a project that's received funding from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Ocean Acidification Program for education and citizen science training for coastal acidification monitoring. Um, this is the, the launch of uh, this project, and so we're just really excited to welcome you all uh, today on, on the phone. Um, this project uh, is designed to support trainings for citizen science groups in the Northeast. Um, the webinars are the first part of that, and we have been working together with active citizen science monitoring groups throughout the region and are planning additional uh, trainings and workshops. A lot of this has been spurred, as you will hear today, um, from the exciting development of new EPA guidelines for monitoring ocean and coastal acidification. Uh, so before we get started with our presentation, I'm going to hand things over to Kelly Canisi for a moment, uh, and she's going to introduce some of the webinar logistics. Uh, there'll be a couple presentations followed by questions and answers. Um, so Kelly, uh, take it away, and thanks so much and welcome. Thank you, Erin, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Kelly Canacy. I am a program coordinator for NERACUS and the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, and I also manage the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange, which is a new collaborative website. I'll share more information about NECAN and the Information Exchange later in the webinar, but for now, I wanted to orient you to some of the mechanics of this go-to webinar, just so you know what to expect and how to communicate with us if needed. First of all, there is currently a poll on the screen, and we're hoping to hear from you a little bit about your comfort level with the topic of ocean and coastal acidification, just because this is a really diverse group of citizen scientists, researchers, concerned citizens, uh, administrators, and so it would be really interesting to see that distribution. And the poll is completely anonymous, so don't be shy. <laughs> we'll collect responses for another minute or so. It looks like almost everyone has voted. And then we'll show the results on the screen so you can get a sense of what uh, the rest of the group said. So in addition to the poll, we have some features here that you can use. If you have questions, you can use the question box to type in your question. I will then read your question aloud at the end of the webinar. So you can type you know, during the presentations or you can wait till the end if you prefer. And we'll have a, a session at the end um, where we can actually answer those questions. We'll try to get to all of the questions, but if not, we will answer via email because we'll have your questions written down. You can also use the chat function if you have something you want to share with the whole group. Um, that's also in your GoToWebinar panel, uh, and you can select who you share that resource with. I will share a few links through the chat function, so look out for those. And I think that is it. So it looks like we have 100% of our attendees who responded to the poll, so I'm going to close it. And then we should be able to see now the results. Great. Um, this is exciting to see, and it seems like a fair number of attendees uh, know a fair amount, but want to hear more about uh, ocean and specifically coastal acidification. This is really helpful uh, to see, and so everyone can see that. Um, and for those of you who have some significant gaps left, which is a quarter of you, 
part of our goal today is to try to fill in some of those gaps um, as well as really to get everyone on the same page about what's really at stake in ocean and coastal acidification monitoring. So we'll we'll launch in uh, now to our, our presentations. All right, welcome to our first uh, of a two-part webinar series. Again, this is through a grant funded from the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program for Education and Citizen Science Training for Coastal Acidification Monitoring. I, I want to acknowledge just the incredible team that's put this together um, from NOAA, from uh, EPA, Jason Greer has been incredibly helpful, and particularly uh, Carolina Bastidas, Kristen Bannock, and Katie Clayton, um, who are part of the team that's developing uh, citizen science training programs throughout the Northeast region. So why ocean and coastal acidification monitoring? So we're gonna answer that question um, in kind of three parts. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the why, what the value of ocean and coastal acidification monitoring is and why nearshore monitoring by citizen science groups is so critical uh, to addressing some gaps in our understanding. Then Beth Turner from NOAA is going to discuss uh, the parameters that are measured for OCA monitoring, and we're gonna kind of dive into some of uh, the, the chemistry that's at stake and what we're actually talking about when we're talking about OCA monitoring. And we hope that this spurs uh, those of you who are part of citizen science teams and citizen science orga monitoring organizations to have some motivation to start monitoring if you haven't already. Again, this is the first in a two-part series with our next webinar on April 18th, again at 10 a.m. When we think about ocean acidification, the driver of the changing chemistry in our global ocean is carbon dioxide emissions um, from human activities, like the combustion of fossil fuels from transportation in our region. And the excess CO2 in the atmosphere that enters the ocean has consequences for organisms that live there. These are some of the things that acidification can do to some shell forming organisms. Now Beth's gonna go into some of the details of the chemical changes, but why do we care about these changes? Well, they're potentially pretty huge in terms of the uh, ecological significance of the changes for organisms that we care about. There've been a couple studies that have actually tried to assess the economic impacts of future ocean acidification if emissions continue on their current trajectory. Global economic impacts by the end of the century could be in the hundreds of billions of dollars due to impacts on commercially important shellfish, and on uh, coral reefs. Closer to home, there have been just a handful of studies, primarily focused on the offshore scallop industry, that project losses in the hundreds of millions of dollars with potentially thousands of jobs at risk. But in order to inform our understanding of exactly what the risk is to our economy and to our livelihoods of people here in the Northeast, we need information about the changes that are taking place, not simply from global models of increased carbon dioxide emissions. And to that end, NIRACUS has been instrumental in establishing a network of buoy systems uh, that are starting to monitor and have been monitoring offshore changes in ocean chemistry. But closer to shore in our estuaries in the Northeast, it's more complicated than simply the rise of global carbon dioxide emissions. In these regions, there are lots of things which can change carbonate chemistry, lots of things which can change pH, and therefore lots of different potential drivers that we need to be concerned about. And when we say drivers, we mean things like nutrient pollution, colder, fresher water, and, ex and heavy and extreme storm events, which could be having an effect on acidification in these regions. Now, we don't have enough information to understand the different contribution to, to acidification of global atmospheric carbon dioxide or these other factors. But we know we care about them because it's in these regions where we have our clam diggers and our productive clam flats. It's in these regions where our oyster aquaculture um, is expanding. And it's in these nearshore regions where most of our shellfish operations take place. And so right now we're starting to get a picture of the change, chemical changes that are taking place offshore. But what we need 
is more information in the near shore environments that are much more complex. And putting one of those expensive buoys in every single one of these estuaries up and down from, from Lubeck all the way to Provincetown and around down into Long Island Sound isn't really feasible. And that's where the value of citizen science monitoring comes in. Because if we're gonna to respond to these changes and the potential impacts that they're gonna have on the livelihoods of people in these systems, we need to know more about what's controlling the changes in these systems. We need to know more about that in order to potentially reduce the effects of acidification or adapt to the effects by changing our practices. And getting that kind of predictive information is the goal of managers and scientists and people in industry in this region. So the value of citizen science monitoring, why do this for acidification? First of all, we have a big data gap. We need a lot more data from near shore environments that have thus far been understudied in terms of ocean acidification and the dynamics of changing chemical environments that are important for shell forming organisms in those regions. Doing so would allow an understanding of the multiple controls on acidification in places where impacts are most important to us. Now we've, we've basically known that for a few years, so why now? Well, just this year, the Environmental Protection Agency has released guidelines for coastal acidification monitoring. This presents an opportunity for training groups that are already engaged in water quality monitoring with these new guidelines. And it's this impetus that has spurred our goals for this project to start the process of training and engaging with citizen science monitoring groups about how to monitor for coastal acidification so that we can begin to paint a much more detailed picture of our changing chem coastal chemistry environment in order to respond uh, to this challenge. So that's the motivation behind our work. And now Beth Turner from the National Ocean Service and at NOAA is going to dive into more of the details about what we would actually be monitoring in terms of parameters related to ocean and coastal acidification. And so Kelly's gonna transfer over uh, to Beth to take our presentation from here. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Um... I'll just get set up here. It's just going to take me a minute or two. And um, hopefully you can see my screen. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit more in detail about the uh, nuts and bolts of what's involved in the chemical reactions that contribute to coastal acidification and um, talk some about uh, the parameters that make up the uh, how to measure coastal acidification. I'll talk a little bit about how water quality and the quantity of water relate to coastal acidification. Um, uh, a little bit about potential consequences. Aaron did a good job of talking about that. And a little bit about how citizen science observations um, can help out in this. Uh, so um, just to start things off, I'll give the caveat that I'm not a chemist. I'm an oceanographer, but not a chemical oceanographer. So um, I think that I was uh, volunteered to give this seminar because I was not on the call when they were passing out assignments. Um, but I'm going to uh, walk through it as best I can. And uh, hope I see that a lot of you already have a pretty good background. So hopefully this will be a refresher for a lot of you. But for those of you who uh, this is your first time, I'll try to uh, make it understandable. So as Aaron mentioned, uh, ocean acidification, this is offshore and out in the global ocean, um, that's caused by increases in, in carbon dioxide emissions that are absorbed by the ocean. So the graph on the left-hand side, you see uh, the red line, which is the increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, this, this uh, data record happens to go until 2015, um, it's still going up. Uh, the green wavy line is the amount of carbon dioxide that's been absorbed into seawater, and the blue wavy line is the pH of seawater, and if you recall, pH is a negative scale, so as pH goes down, uh, that means that the water is getting uh, more acidic. But in addition to the uh, magnitude of change, the time scale of this change is really important too. Uh, and so this other graph that just uh, popped up is uh, the time in millions of years before present 
um, showing that our current um, pH is within the range of this uh, historic time record. But if you project out to 2050 and 2100, uh, that changes much more than we have seen over the past um, 20 million years. Um, so this is important um, in terms of organisms not having the time to adapt um, through evolution. So um, here we go into the chemistry of things. And I'm going to uh, walk through these things. It's a little overwhelming to see this set of equations there. Um, so I'm going to break it down a little bit. So as we mentioned, carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the ocean and becomes a dissolved phase. Uh, once that carbon dioxide gets into the ocean, uh, it tends to form carbonic acid. So these arrows and the reactions, uh, the size of the arrows um, demonstrates how easily the reaction goes. So because this, this arrow is bigger going to the right, that means that most of the carbon dioxide in water gets converted to carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid is a weak acid, so it tends to dissociate into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Um, so again, that, that uh, big arrow going to the right means that um, a lot of this carbonic Carbonic acid dissociates immediately into bicarbonate and hydrogen. That hydrogen ion is what you're measuring when you measure pH. And uh, so that's why pH is a direct measure of, of um, acidity. And some of those hydrogen ions grab onto carbonate ions that are floating around in the ocean and form more bicarbonate. Uh, so a consequence of this is that there's less carbonate ions around to react with calcium ions to form calcium carbonate. And that's what forms the shells and, uh, and exoskeletons of corals and some other plankton. So um, one way to measure the impact of acidification is this omega value or the calcium carbonate saturation state. Um, sometimes that's called the calcate saturation state or the aragonite saturation state depending upon which form the calcium carbonate takes. Uh, if that omega value is greater than one, that means that calcium carbonate can be deposited. If it's less than one, that means that calcium carbonate gets dissolved. So uh, that omega value is, is a pretty good indication of uh, kind of the baseline conditions that uh, even make it possible to form shells. And that omega can be calculated once you have a, an idea of these other parameters in seawater. So meanwhile, um, that's just the chemistry side of things. But then biology always gets in there and, and kind of makes things more complex. So uh, one thing that happens with this carbon dioxide in water, uh, if there are plants around or phytoplankton floating in the ocean uh, and there's enough light and uh, mixing of nutrients, then photosynthesis happens, and some of that carbon dioxide in water gets converted into sugars and oxygen. And in the other direction, there's uh, fish and, and snails and, and microbial interactions that respire, and that drives the reaction in the other direction and breaks down sugar and consumes oxygen and creates more carbon dioxide. So there are, uh, there's even a, a bigger source of carbon dioxide uh, through respiration. And this uh, turns out to be quite important in the coastal ocean. So if we're going to be measuring these uh, parameters that make up the carbonate system, what do we actually measure? Uh, one thing we measure is, well, so there's four measurements that, that can, can characterize uh, what's happening in the carbonate system. There's PCO2, which is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. That's just this dissolved form of carbon dioxide. There's dissolved inorganic carbon, which is uh, any inorganic carbon that uh, is in the ocean. Um, we should note that um, because of the direction of these arrows, um, a lot of the, um, the uh, constituent that makes up most of the dissolved inorganic carbon is bicarbonate and carbonate. So bicarbonate is by far the biggest pool, um, followed by carbonate, and then um, PCO2 and, and uh, carbonic acid are relatively small pools. Uh, pH, as I mentioned, uh, is uh, directly measuring that hydrogen ion. Uh, 
remember that this is a negative log scale. So as the number of hydrogen ions go up, uh, the, the pH goes down. And it's a log scale, so a small change in the pH scale means a great big change in the number of hydrogen ions. And then finally, total alkalinity are all of the ions that react with that positive hydrogen ion um, to reduce acidity, so all of the negative ions. And again, this is mostly bicarbonate and carbonate, but there are some other negative ions in seawater. When you know any two of these parameters, you can calculate the others um, because of this interrelationship of the various uh, chemical equations. And if you choose different parameters, you have different uncertainties when you calculate uh, the, the carbonate system. Uh, the largest uncertainty occurs when you uh, combine pH and PCO2 measurements. Uh, if you look on this, this little table um, and you go from the pH side over to PCO2, you see that's about 5.7% uncertainty, and it can go higher. Uh, the smallest uncertainty is with the DIC and, and total alkalinity, and if you combine those, that's a 1.7% uh, about um, uncertainty. Um, but I'd like to point out that currently our uncertainty is infinite um, if we don't have any measurements. So um, the, uh, most of these uh, will be covered in our second set of webinars when uh, Jason Greer is going to talk about weather uh, observations versus climate observations and the different um, uncertainties needed uh, for different uh, purposes. So believe it or not, that's the easy part. Um, because there's a lot of other things that happen in coastal acidification, as Aaron um, alluded to. Uh, for one thing, here in the Northeast, um, carbon dioxide, like most gases, dissolves easier in cold water. And we have a lot of cold water in the Northeast. And that cold water has a lower buffering capacity. This buffering capacity is uh, the capacity for resistance against change in pH. And um, cold, fresh water has a lower buffering capacity. It has fewer of those negative ions that are um, coming into uh, the system. And so here's a map of the Gulf of Maine. And these uh, red areas are that measure of omega, a uh, ragonite saturation state. And you can see that the red areas are below one. So the, that's like a 0.5 aragonite saturation state. So these places that are close to river mouths, that are uh, very close to shore, are already corrosive um, in terms of the uh, omega value. And then uh, in addition to fresh water, we've got a lot of things coming in with the fresh water. Uh, we've got erosion from the land that brings fertilizers, that brings stormwater runoff, that brings um, uh, various uh, pollutants from the land. Uh, we can have upwelling uh, from the deeper Gulf of Maine waters. So there's a lot of mixing going on. There's a lot of stuff coming in uh, from the, the various rivers. And in the Northeast, the rivers are carrying water that's been flowing over pine forests and granite. So um, that, that uh, river is uh, naturally uh, less buffered, as I mentioned before. And also, as we saw before, there are there is evidence of riverine drivers of coastal acidification. This is a little bit um, a higher resolution map of what's going on around Casco Bay. Again, this is aragonite. Um, I apologize, the colors are reversed here. Um, but again, you see that close to shore, uh, that aragonite value is around 0.4. Uh, and when you get further away, it's up to two. So these are, are localized areas um, and primarily driven um, by this freshwater input. And then we can also have uh, nutrient enhanced coastal acidification where there are lower um, aragonite saturation values, uh, higher CO2, found in areas of low oxygen. And uh, this works because when you have nutrients coming in, that uh, causes enhanced primary productivity and that excess productivity sinks to the bottom and starts to be decomposed by uh, my microbial respiration. 
And that means that more CO2 gets delivered to the bottom water. So this is not atmospheric CO2. This is CO2 that's driven by uh, nutrient input that then um, causes an excess of uh, production. And here's some data from Narragansett Bay, uh, where you see on the left-hand side um, these um, uh, low saturation values in oxygen and uh, corresponding um, uh, lowest omega values. So why do we care? Um, as Aaron alluded, it's harder for larval bivalves, especially larval bivalves, to make shells um, when the, the uh, omega saturation states are low. And here's just some pictures of uh, shells of uh, larval clams that have been raised in sediments um, of low aragonite saturation state. And uh, as time goes on, uh, you can see that those shells are uh, a little bit more deformed. And um, here's some more uh, pictures from uh, larval scallops and clams that were raised in uh, differing uh, seawater values of CO2. And what I want you to note here is that uh, from the low CO2 um, at the top of the screen to the high CO2 at the bottom, uh, they are smaller and they are uh, kind of deformed. And the important thing to note here is that this is not uh, projections into the future necessarily. This is today's PCO2 in the middle of the plot there. So these effects are happening now. So this is not some theoretical thing that you know could be happening if we don't do anything about carbon dioxide emissions. This is actually um, affecting uh, the, or could potentially be affecting um, shellfish growth today. So uh, how do we assess uh, what's happening in our region? Um, we did an analysis of the uh, monitoring assets that we have currently um, through the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network. And what we found was this plot on the left-hand side um, this looks like we've got really good coverage around the Gulf of Maine. It looks like there's a lot of stuff going on, and there is a lot of stuff going on. But what I'd like to point out is the color. And if you look at the color, there's a small bar that's a sampling frequency, and the purple and the blue colors means that it's sampled uh, very infrequently. So this um, purple line and the blue lines, they're not run very often. And the things that are run more often are in the red and the, the sort of uh, orangey colors. So while we have data um, from the Gulf of Maine, uh, we don't have it at very high frequency. Uh, Aaron also mentioned that we do have some uh, great buoys that allow us to provide uh, a lot of more um, uh, fine scale observations in terms of the time. And this is just a little record from the Great Bay buoy. Um, but those are pretty few and far between. Uh, now we do have an East Coast ocean acidification cruise coming up this summer. Uh, one of those purple lines on the previous graph was the earlier um, ECOA cruise. That was in 2015. Uh, we have another one scheduled for June 26th to the July uh, 12th or 15th, somewhere around there. Um, these are mostly offshore stations. Uh, this is zoomed in a little bit to our region. And right now, the plan is that they're going to be um, around the, uh, the Cape Cod and, and New Hampshire stations around the 27th of June. They're going to be going up the coast of Maine around the 28th. Um, they're going to be around Long Island Sound. Um, they're going to make this circle around the Gulf of Maine and then come back uh, in July to the Long Island Sound area. Um, so these, these dates are still in negotiation, but um, I'd say, you know, somewhere around that time, there's going to be a ship out in the uh, deep water monitoring what's going on in the Gulf of Maine and in the, the deeper areas of Long Island Sound. So um, how do citizen science groups fit in? Um, coastal acidification, I hope um, I've been able to uh, tell you that uh, it's related to things that you are already measuring. Um, oxygen in the water, 
freshwater runoff, the number, amount of nutrients, uh, temperature. So all of these things feed into uh, what is driving coastal acidification. Uh, adding carbonate measurements um, to the nearshore monitoring can help to track these coastal trends and can help fill in the lower frequency of monitoring uh, that happens further offshore. And as Aaron noted before, the impacts are nearshore. Um, so knowing those local conditions is important, um, not just for uh, really teasing out the implications for the carbonate system, but uh, more importantly, um, thinking about the implications to natural resources and to coastal economies. And it can also be a very powerful tool to engage other people uh, in these issues and to uh, inform them about what's going on in their backyard or in their uh, back beach. Uh, so that's all I had for you today and um, I'm happy to take questions, um, but right now I'm going to send it back to Kelly and Kelly's going to talk about some of the resources that are available through uh, NECAN and through uh, the new uh, OA Information Exchange. Thank you, Beth. And thanks, Beth and Erin, for those presentations. I think that was a great overview of ocean and coastal acidification monitoring, and it sets a really good foundation for us to have a discussion about OCA in the context of citizen science groups. I see that there are a number of questions that came in over the course of those presentations, which we will get to in just a second, but I have one last thing to share before we get to that. I'm about to send a couple of links to everyone so that you can access these resources, which I think will be really helpful if you're interested in learning more about OCA monitoring. So the first one is the NECAN website, which you should see on your screen right now. NECAN is the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, which has come up a couple times throughout these presentations. And it's a regional collaborative of academic research scientists, as well as people working in industry, like shell fisheries, fisheries, tourism, people working in education and outreach, including citizen science groups, and people working in policy. So NECAN helps facilitate activities within each of those groups, and it also helps uh, facilitate collaboration among the groups, uh, which creates ultimately a better informed and more effective community. So the NECAN website, which is uh, NECAN.org, is a really good resource if you're interested in learning more about coastal acidification in the Northeast region. You can, I won't go into too much detail, but each of these tabs has more information about OCA on the science side. You can also read about effects on certain marine species. You can read about uh, research priorities in the Northeast and regional conditions in the Northeast. And then this Take Action tab uh, just gives a little bit more information for citizens who are interested in reducing their impact on the environment when it comes to OCA. Um, so I think this is a really interesting page to browse. And thanks for your patience as I'm going through this rather quickly. <laughs> Another tab that I think would be really useful for you to check out is the NECAN Resources tab, which is up here at the top right. You can see my cursor. So this is where you'll find uh, not only a recording of this webinar, uh, there will be a link here by the end of today, but you can access other webinars that have focused on research and monitoring in the Northeast. And there are a number of other resources uh, that give really useful information. One other thing to point out here is our education and outreach working group. So they have pulled together a set of materials for educators uh, and people working in outreach, including citizen science groups, that really help educate the public about ocean and coastal acidification. And there are plenty of resources here. So it's a great resource if you are interested in finding the best one to share with your volunteers or your particular group. And then the last thing I'll show on this page is the reference library. So if you'd like to dig a little deeper into the science, we have a very large reference library. You can go through uh, chronologically here. 
or I'm just going to scroll all the way to the bottom. You can click on specific topics. So if you wanted to learn more about crustaceans, for example, you can click that link and then you'll see all the papers that we have related to uh, crustacean and impacts of OA on those species. So that is the NECAN website and I encourage all of you to visit. A second website that you might find useful is the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. This is a really new website. It launched in February of this year. And not only does it have information about OCA, but also it's a place where people can have discussions about ocean and coastal acidification. So it's actually a highly interactive and a place where you can develop new collaborations with people both within your network and outside of your network. And it's an international group, so it's becoming very diverse and we have a lot of unique perspectives. So this is definitely a place to look if you want to join the conversation. You do need to request access in order to join the site. So if you do that today, then I can approve your account and you can be a new member. Once you are a member, you'll have access to um, this collaborative side of the site where you can see there are a number of conversations going on. Uh, it's a lot like you know any social media site, but we have specific tools that allow you to share resources and have conversations about OCA. And there are also teams that you can join, so I would encourage you to take a look at our People and Teams page. We have one specifically focused on the Northeast region, and there's also a team on education and outreach. So if you have any questions from today's set of presentations that we don't get to or that you want to continue talking about, you could go to one of these teams and pose your question there. And then not only will you have answers from the presenters, but you can pull other people into the conversation as well. So that's it for resources that I wanted to share. And I think now we can get into the Q&A section. So I'm just gonna go in order. Um, the first question is from Jason Masters, and this came during Aaron's presentation. Jason says, I was a NOAA carbon chemist at AOML. I now have my own oyster farm in Eastern Long Island, and I want to help out with data collection for citizen science. Who can I directly talk to to start implementing data collection in my work? So, uh, this so is Beth. Uh, Go ahead, Beth. This is awesome. Um, we, in addition to um, our our education and outreach group through NECAN that uh, was mentioned, um, we also have an industry working group. Um, so, if you go to the NECAN website, uh, you can uh, look at the industry working group. I believe there's a uh, a contact, but um, if not, you can send an email to uh, one of us, um, which Kelly, uh, maybe you can uh, provide your email to the um, to the chat, and um, that would be really great to and train some measurements from uh, from Long Island. I should also mention that um, in addition to NECAN, there is a Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network that you may also want to uh, get involved in. Uh, they're kind of looking, um, we look sort of at the northern side of Long Island Sound, they're looking at the southern side of Long Island and down uh, into the Chesapeake. So um, you are probably straddling those two regions. So uh, MACAN, um, the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network, also um, uh, should be a great resource for you. And Jason, uh, this is Aaron. Thanks so much for your question. It's super exciting. Um, uh, and just to add on to what Beth said, uh, from the NECAN and Northeast region, the sort of locus of organizing collaborations of citizen science monitoring is taking place in, on the Connecticut side of Long Island Sound right now. So you are in sort of straddling these these two, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic uh, regions, um, but we can follow up and make sure that uh, you're connected with conversations with the, um, the Connecticut team um, and the scientists that are involved there are, are really focused on Long Island Sound, which is the region that, uh, that you're in. So 
I'm really happy to have you on board and we'll, we'll connect on, on that as well. Yeah, if you could um, put in your email um, to the chat box, then Kelly will make sure that um, you're added to the NECAN uh, listserv and um, we can make sure that you're included in, um, in some of our further outreach. Great, thank you. The next question is from Jack Gilbert. He asked, what measures are used to determine the pH of the ocean 20 million years ago? Is it ice cores, sediment analysis, or some other technique? Um, so, okay, now you're running up against my, uh, the boundaries of my knowledge. <laughs> um, however, um, a lot of it is through ice cores, some of it is through um, analyses of coccolithophores, these um, calcium forming organisms that um, sink to the bottom and get incorporated into sediments. Um, and some of it is um, uh, modeling that's done based on um, the atmospheric carbon dioxide of uh, ice core measurements. So uh, I think there's a variety of techniques that uh, look that far back. Uh, and and if I can add to that, um, for a lot of paleo work on the carbonate system, we use the isotopic form of boron. Um, boron has two isotopes, boron 11 and boron 10, and about an 80 to 20 ratio of 11 to, to 10. Um, that ratio changes as the pH in the ocean changes and um, modulates between boric acid and borate ions. So if we actually get old shells, that were laid down, we can get an estimate as a proxy of the pH condition or the carbonate chemistry condition uh, in which that shell was laid down. And this method is used to try to understand um, the sort of paleoceanographic conditions of pH, because we obviously didn't have pH meters long ago, in addition to everything that, that Beth laid out. Um, and that's actually really exciting because baseline measurements are pretty important. Um, and sort of knowing what's changed over a hundred years actually can become a pretty cr critical question in these highly variable nearshore environments. So thanks for your question, and uh, and it's definitely something we 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 consider. Okay, great. Next is a question from Katie Goldsmith. She asked, who developed the map with the ECOA to cruise locations? Um, that was in your presentation, Beth. Um, Katie also had a really good suggestion that we should share that map with the group. Yeah, so that map, map comes from um, Joe Salisbury. Um, Joe Salisbury and Wei Jun Kai. Joe Salisbury is at UNH, Wei Jun Kai is at University of Delaware, and they are the uh, lead investigators on that ECOA cruise. Um, so the cruise track is still being uh, refined um, somewhat. Um, I think that once it is finalized, it's going to be um, on the uh, website for um, AOML, the Atlantic Oceanographic um, and Meteorological Laboratory, or Marine Laboratory. So I think that uh, it will be publicly available, but I think that what I showed can't be shared quite yet because it's not finalized. Okay, good call. So I just uh, sent a message to Katie, but just to let everyone else know, we'll keep tabs on that um, and make sure to share it once it's available. The next question is from Kathleen Thornton. She asked, or said organic alkalinity can be substantial in areas of high CDOM, such as estuarine areas. Do the new EPA guidelines address the effect of organic alkalinity on total alkalinity measurements in coastal and estuarine areas? Yes, thank you. Um, so those guidelines uh, mention um, the CDOM contribution. Um, they do, I'm trying to remember. I don't think they directly talk about um, measuring it and combining it into uh, the total alkalinity, but I would have to look at them again to make sure. Um, I don't know if Jason is on the call. If it is, then he can probably answer that.
But anyway, I will try to get back to you on that um, because I'm not exactly sure, um, you know, the depth to which the, the new guidelines incorporate that. But um, thanks, that's a great uh, uh, addition. Yeah, I don't see Jason on the call today, but we can follow up. Uh, the next question is from Alexandra Puritz, who asks, what specific tools and methods do you recommend for citizen science? Is there a level of precision or uncertainty that you recommend staying within? So, so this is Aaron, and that's a really great question, and you saw the, um, the table that uh, Beth put up, um, and we really want to emphasize something. Um, you know, a lot of the goal here is to understand uh, the carbonate system, and we say that we mean being able to calculate uh, the saturation state or, or omega, and you need two of those four parameters to sort of solve the whole carbon carbonate system, two of the four parameters being DIC, pH, PCO2, or total alkalinity, and there's different uncertainties associated with, with which two you combine, um, but I, we really want to underscore the point, and in the planning for this this call, we sort of emphasized it, that it, it's really great to have pH measurements. And you might look at that and say, wow, there's more uncertainty with pH and PCO2, um, and, and we all should be doing DIC and total alkalinity because there's less uncertainty there. But our uncertainty, if we have no measurements in a location, as Beth said, is infinite. Um, and so it, all measurements really help solve this system. Um, and a lot will come down to the capacity and capability of organization. So our additional conversation in the next webinar is about calibration issues, um, how to make sure that the measurements that you're you're getting are 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 good. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how to make the measurements um, of these different parameters and Jason will walk us through the, the guidelines. Um, but but part of the goal there is to say wherever you are and whatever the level of your your abilities um, your capacity to monitor could be uh, along a really wide range. And all of those data are really useful and important. And they're even more useful and important if they're part of a sort of coordinated um, effort uh, across different groups where groups are talking to each other about calibration methods and using guidelines and sort of standard operating procedures, um, regardless of the particular instruments you, that, that you have. Um, so there's not a hard and fast that we need this level of certainty or uncertainty, um, but uh, part of our training effort is to really walk through uh, with the groups that we're working with um, what they can do and what kinds of information they can record that will uh, benefit the ability for that information to be used later on. Um, knowing where and when the measurement was taken is, is really important, um, for example. So we'll be talking about a lot more of that as the as these trainings continue. Okay, and there were actually a number of questions about the EPA guidelines. Um, just jumping back for a second, and I don't think, as we mentioned, I don't think they've been released yet. But Jason will be talking about them during the next webinar. Okay, so the next question comes from Ron Huber. Ron asked, have any studies been made of the impact of acidification on the ability of marine bacteria to form biofilms? Bacterial biofouling of marine surfaces is essential for attracting algae zoospores to settle on those rocks or pilings. They thus play an important role. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Um, there have been some pretty limited studies on uh, biofilm and uh, the impact of acidification. Um, some of those have been uh, due to uh, the lobster industry and the interaction between uh, biofilm and uh, protection from uh, lobster shell disease. Um, so I would say there's been limited studies. Um, Certainly not, uh, you know, really definitive ones uh, up to date. Um, one thing that you have to remember about acidification studies in general is they're really, really new. I mean, we just have started to scratch the surface on a lot of these issues. And so we have a lot more unknowns than we have knowns at this point. Um, and 
uh, where this is kind of a, a new science. It's ramping up. Um, it's very exciting because there's a lot of, of new data coming in. Um, but in terms of definitive information, um, and a lot of the times we have to say, wow, we really don't know very much about that. <laughs> Yeah, and Ron also, he sent a second message just asking about citizen microbiology in general, whether on that topic or more broadly. Um, I think that's a really interesting concept and I uh, encourage him and everyone else on the webinar today to go on to the information exchange if you want to maybe brainstorm or share citizen microbiology that you've done with your groups. I think that would be a great place to discuss and share more. So we have a little bit more time for more questions. I think we'll be able to get to everyone. The next one comes from Stena Troyer. Who is the Pacific Northwest representative? And I'm not, I can't remember exactly what this was referring to. Um, uh, so Pacific Northwest representative for what? Um, so the Pacific Northwest has a really robust activity uh, around coastal acidification and ocean acidification. Um, a lot of this is uh, coordinated through uh, NANUS, the uh, sister organization to NIRACUS. And um, Jan Newton is a big uh, proponent of a lot of that activity on the West Coast. Um, yeah, so I guess um, I'd like to know a little bit more about what particularly um, you're asking a representative representative of, of what? Yeah, I can actually, um, I'll wait a second just to see, but I can unmute you if you'd like to ask your question. I don't know if I did it justice. <laughs> so I just, do you wanna ask? Yeah, so, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. So I'm just from the Pacific Northwest. So I'm here in Washington State, and um, I think I'm assuming that the similar protocols would be used here. So I just wanted to double check that. Um, mostly just asking. I think it was pretty much in relation to the first question of you know who was representing folks on the East Coast, and just wondering if there was a good connection here on the West Coast to touch base with when if we were to start doing like a citizen science project. Yeah, I would reach out to Jan if you could. Um, if she okay, is not the yeah. right person, um, Jan oh. Newton. Um, if you Google um, Nanus and Jan Newton, she should come up right away. That's awesome. N-A-N-O-O-S. Um, if she's not the right person directly to answer your question, I'm sure she can put you in touch with the person who is. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the the governor's office in Washington State also has a, an active uh, role to play in ocean acidification monitoring. Um, Julie Horwich is, uh, is the person coordinating that, but I think you could get the ball rolling by reaching out to, to Jan, as, as Beth said. Um, they just have a robust network out there, and through the OA information exchange that Kelly talked about, um, we have good connections and are discussing, you know, lessons learned uh, and sharing that information with them. Um, and hopefully we'll do more of that in the future. Yeah, this seems like a good webinar for the folks over on this side of the, the U.S. But here we are. Yeah, the, uh, the West Coast example is a little bit different because of the upwelling that happens along the West Coast. That has a major um, contribution uh, where it's, it's a less of a contribution on the East Coast here. So, um, you know, the, there are slightly different uh, magnitudes of the drivers in the different regions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your question. The next question, and we have probably time for one or two more, um, so I'll just go through them. The next question is from Edwin Green, who said, we're already doing testing here and want to know what instruments we can use to measure carbonate, where to get them, and how much they cost. 
do our volunteers need to be trained to use those instruments? Yeah, so um, thanks for that. I'm sure this is uh, actually a question that a lot of people have. And um, one of the things that uh, we hope to pursue through this project is um, to come up with exactly those sorts of lists of things. You know, a lot of the, um, the bench chemistry is probably beyond the group of a lot of citizen scientists. Um, but I think there are um, collaborations to be made um, with, uh, with more analytical chemistry groups. Um, and there are certainly um, pH sensors that are affordable for citizen science groups. So uh, I would say stay tuned on that um, because that's one of the things we're going to be exploring um, through this, this uh, project as it goes on. Uh, really, thanks for that question, and we know that's a question that so many of you are are are, are asking. Um, and in the next webinar, um, we'll have an opportunity to dive into the sort of how, what, and why of, of measuring. And we want to take a really um, sort of total view of all the options, um, whether it's collecting samples that are then run in an analytical lab, or whether it's using uh, various sensors. This is a fast-moving technological area. Just in the last couple of years, um, there have been some new uh, instruments that have been um, brought online to be able to measure PCO2. Um, Turner Systems has developed one. There's work being done actively on being able to measure total alkalinity um, with a sort of field deployable wet chemistry. The price tags for those range, um, and we will be talking about uh, the sort of full set of those um, uh, uh, as this project moves on. Um, in terms of uh, what can be monitored and measured, it's important to remember that not everything is uh, necessarily going to be um, a handheld uh, uh, me electronic measurement device, right? There's a lot of value in a lot of the water quality monitoring we all do in terms of taking samples and the complexities of um, how we actually take samples so that they can be analyzed and are accurate for uh, DIC or total alkalinity measurements. Um, is, is a core focus of this project as well. So it's a combination of new sensors um, and uh, the treatment and standard operating procedures for wet chemistry measurements um, that are how we start to get at some of these parameters uh, beyond pH, which most people are a little bit more familiar with, but, uh, but pH also requires some conversations about calibration. Um, so there's a full suite of potential options depending on who your volunteers are and depending on um, the, the resources available and the connections that are available. And as we roll out webinars and additional uh, interactive trainings, um, that's exactly what uh, our goal is to, to explore with everyone. All right, I think we have time for one more quick question and we just happen to have one more <laughs> in the chat box. So I'll ask that and if you have other questions that uh, we don't have time to get to. You can still continue to type them in and we'll answer them later via email or you can send them to the information exchange once you have an account or you can email the presenters directly. Um, so the last question is from Carol White. Is there any possibility or interest in implementing an oyster or shellfish dashboard like they have on the west coast for San Cus with interested aquaculturists here in the northeast? <coughs> Uh, so, yes, I mean, there's interest in doing it. Um, so the West Coast and the East Coast are really different in terms of the way um, aquaculture operates. Um, you know, there are a lot more smaller uh, farms here on the East Coast. Uh, there's fewer larger farms on the West Coast. Um, that said, um, I think that uh, certainly one of the things that the industry working group through NECAN is interested in doing is assessing uh, industry partners and figuring out uh, you know, what their needs are in terms of information and how best to meet that information need. Um, so if that turns out to be a kind of a dashboard, um, then you know, that's certainly something that, that we would consider um, putting together. Uh, you know, if, if it's something that's more like a periodic bulletin or if it's something that's a little bit more um, text driven, 
um, you know, so we have to kind of assess with our, our industry partners, uh, you know, what format they want information in, how often they want that information, uh, and what information they want. Uh, so I think all options are on the table right now, but uh, we're still in kind of fact-finding mode um, with, with the industry partners. Okay, thanks. I'm just um, typing out the email addresses for Aaron, Beth, and Parker right now so that if you want to follow up with them, you can do so directly. Um, but that concludes our Q&A session. Thanks so much for everyone for, for joining this webinar. Um, the next uh, in our webinar series will be on April 18th um, at 10. and that will really be an introduction to the EPA guidelines, discussions of bottle sampling, calibration, metadata, what to do with handheld pH meters, et cetera. Um, and so many of the, uh, the questions that we had there at the end uh, will be the topic of the next webinar. And again, we just want to thank you all for engaging um, the, the path forward on developing a robust citizen science monitoring program for coastal certification starts with everyone um, and all of you. And so thank you for participating and thanks for everyone for helping put this together today. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, thank you, Nerikus and Kelly, for, for hosting us.